Hi everyone. It's Miss Kinder here. Oh my gosh, I miss you guys so much. Um, and I hope you guys are doing well, that you're healthy, that you're safe, that you're finding a good way to pass all this time that we have. I've been playing a lot of Animal Crossing New Horizons. Does anybody else play that game? It's been great. That's been kind of keeping me sane, playing a little basketball with my son when the weather's nice. Um, but you know, I've been watching the news and they keep extending the closures of the schools. And so I got to thinking, I hate that we've come so far with nickel and dimed and we've had that interrupted. So I've decided to do a few videos. Remember this book of me reading um, the book that we've been working on. And I'll just do a little bit at a time, maybe just a couple pages um, and provide a little commentary on it. But boy, is it particularly relevant with what's going on right now in our economy with so many service workers, waitresses, housekeepers, people who are in the uh, travel industry struggling right now um, because so many things like that are shut down and they're just not making money. Um, and this is, you know, really the Barbara's story of working in that industry and discovering how difficult it is to make a living. So welcome to my bedroom and um, welcome to chapter two of Nickel and Dime. Uh, we ended on chapter one. Barbara was at uh, Key West, Florida when she left her job. Do you remember that? She was a waitress and she just walked out one night. She had had it. Uh, they were understaffed and the customers were terrible and then the manager came back screaming at her about the eggs and she was like that's it I'm leaving and she just walks out but now she's gonna go try something different in Maine so here I am chapter two scrubbing in Maine and I'm just gonna read a little bit of it um, and you know if you're watching this following along God bless you thank you that this time I've spent doing this is not in vain and I hope you know how much I appreciate you and how much I miss you so much all right here we go chapter two scrubbing in Maine I chose Maine for its whiteness now you remember race does come up a couple times in her discussion of all these things so you see my husband's water bottle sitting back there that's his he's a mess you tell him to straighten up um Race is something that, and, and language, is something that Barbara's talked about a couple times in this book. And so she's going to encounter sort of a different demographic in Maine than she did in Key West, Florida. So she says, I chose Maine for its whiteness. A few months back in the spring, I'd been in the Portland area for a speaking engagement at a local college and was struck by what appeared to be an extreme case of demographic albinism. So she means all the people there were white. Now she's talking about Portland, Maine, not Portland, Oregon. Portland, Maine is where she is in the Northeast. Not only were the professors and students white, which of course is not uncommon, so were the hotel housekeepers, the panhandlers, and the cab drivers, who in addition to being white also spoke English or at least some are less New England variant thereof. So she's talking about their accents. Now you remember down in Key West, this was not the case. Um, most of the housekeeping staff at the hotel where she worked briefly were either African American or they were from uh, some sort of Spanish speaking country. Uh, many of them were not native English speakers. So up here in Maine, it's much different. Everybody's white. So she's asking herself, one of the reasons she cho chose this area is, is it much different? Does race play a factor in uh, the job market and trying to, to survive on these kinds of wages? So we'll find out. This might not make Maine an ideal setting in which to hunker down for the long haul, but it made it the perfect place for a blue-eyed English-speaking Caucasian to infiltrate the low-wage working excuse me, workforce, no questions asked. As an additional attraction, I noted on my spring visit that the Portland area business community was begging piteously for fresh, employable bodies. So at this point, when Barbara gets there, a lot of people are hiring. Local TV news encouraged viewers to try out for a telemarketing firm offering special mother shifts the classic rock station was promoting job fairs where you could stroll among the employees' tables like a shopper at the mall playing hard to get. Before deciding to return to Maine, 
as an entry level worker, I downloaded the Help Wanted ads from the Portland Press Herald's website and my desktop wheezed from the strain. At least three of the thousand or so ads I scanned promised fun, casual workplace environments. And I pictured flannel shirted teens bantering on their afternoon cider and donut breaks. Maybe I reasoned, when you give white people a whole state to themselves, they treat each other real nice. So she's kind of envisioning in her head as she looks at these wan ads, what life in Maine might be like for a low wage worker wearing a flannel shirt, sitting around drinking cider and eating donuts with their friends on break time. She's wondering, hmm, if there's nothing but uh, a whole state full of white people, is this going to be different from my experience in Florida? You remember there were a lot of immigrants in Florida too. Remember um, George, the guy who didn't really speak English very well that she befriended. So this is a much different situation that she's in here in Maine, much different demographics. On the evening of Tuesday, August 24th, still summer, but with back to school sales shouting for attention from every shopping center, I arrive at the Trailways bus station in Portland and take a cab since it's too late in the day to pick up my rent rack to the Motel 6 that will be my base until I find the prerequisites of normal citizenship, job and home. So she's gotta find a place to live too. This is admittedly an odd venture for anyone not involved in a witness protection program. To leave home and companionship and plop down nearly 2,000 miles away in a place where I know almost no one and about which I am ignorant right down to the most elementary data on geography, weather, and good places to eat. So she, Barbara's saying, you know, when she started in Key West, that was close to where she lived. So she knew a lot about that area. She knew what to expect. Now here she is in Portland and she doesn't know anything. She doesn't know how to get around. She doesn't know where the good places are to eat. She doesn't know anybody that she can talk to about that there. So this is a huge step into the unknown for her. Still, I reason the sudden removal to an unknown state is not all that different from the kinds of dislocations that routinely segment the lives of the truly poor. You lose your job, your car, or your babysitter, or maybe you lose your home because you've been living with a mother or a sister who throws you out when her boyfriend comes back or because she needs the bed or sofa you've been sleeping on for some other wayward family member. And there you are, and here I am as clueless and alone as I have ever been in my grown up life. I'm gonna read one more paragraph and then I'll be done for the day. On this, oh, excuse me, one of the steps AA, which is Alcoholics Anonymous, one of the steps AA asks of recovering alcoholics is to make a searching and fearless moral inventory of themselves. And now alone in my motel room, I find myself fairly obsessed with my stuff how much of it there is and how long it will last. So she's looking at everything she brought with her to Portland and thinking really hard about it and how long it's gonna last her. I have my laptop and a suitcase containing t-shirts, jeans, and khakis, three long sleeve shirts, one pair of shorts, vitamins, and an assort assortment of toiletries, which would be like soap, shampoo, toothpaste, toothbrush, that. I have a tote bag stuffed with books, which will, along with the hike, hiking boots I have brought for the weekends, turn out to be the most useless items in my inventory. I have $1,000 plus, plus some small bills crumpled in pockets. And now for an alarming $59 a night, I have a bed a TV, a phone, and a nearly unobstructed view of Route 25. There are two kinds of low rent motel rooms in America. The Hampton Inn type, which are clearly calibrated rather than decorated. So she's saying they're very careful about the way they set up those rooms at the Hampton Inn to appeal to a certain kind of traveler to produce an atmosphere of menacing sterility. So she says that something that's sterile, sterility is it's super, super clean. So she says Hampton Inn makes it their job to make sure your room looks really clean, almost menacingly so. Ew. 
and the other kind in which history has been allowed to accumulate the form of carpet stains this is the kind she's staying in so a budget motel with lots of carpet stains lingering deposits of cigarette smoke and cheeto crumbs deep under the bed this motel six is the latter cat category which makes it homier you might say or maybe only more haunted Walking out from the main entrance through the VIP auto parts parking lot, you reach the Texaco station, which is like a gas station with a clipper mart attached, which would be a convenience store. Crossing the turnpike from the Texaco, a feat that performed on foot demands both speed and nerve, brings you to a more substantial source of sustenance, including a pizza hut and a shop and save, which is like a discount grocery store. This is, of course, a considerable step up from the situation described in J.G. Ballard's harrowing novel, Concrete Island, in which the hero crashes on to a medium island and finds himself marooned by the traffic, forced to live off the contents of his car and whatever food items he can scrounge from the debris left by motorists. I bring pizza and salad back to my room for dinner telling myself that anything tastes better when acquired at some risk to life and limb like venison fresh from the hunt all right so she's just landed in portland staying in a really dingy motel room um and she's ventured outside to kind of find some food she's managed to make it across route 52 and grab some pizza and now she's going to um, try and find a job and so we'll see what kind of jobs are available to her in Portland. We know there's a lot of want ads, um, but we're not sure yet where she's gonna land. I wonder, do you think she'll be a waitress again? Um, do you think maybe she'll be cleaning hotel rooms? There is a good bit of um, tourism in Maine, like Key West, but a different type of tourist. Um, Maine sits on the ocean, um, but it's, different obviously because it's up north so it's not going to be hot and tropical like key west is it's going to be um a little more rugged and outdoorsy um kind of a, a little bit more like west virginia if west virginia sat on uh, the ocean all right so that's the end of the beginning of chapter two for nickel and dimed i'll read some more in the coming days and i'll post those videos and send you guys the links and if you paid attention to this whole video god bless you thank you um, I hope that maybe we can continue this and certainly if you have comments or questions about what we're reading and how it relates to what's going on right now, um, I'd love to hear them. Message them to me, put them in the comments, um, whatever, but I really miss you guys. I hope you're doing well. Reach out to me through Schoology if you need anything at all. Okay, see you soon. Bye.